Okay, hello everybody. Um, it's great to see you all here. It's lovely, it's a lovely, colourful room. Um, and thank you to all the Malaysian team for all the work you've done to make all this happen. It's great, it's brilliant. Um, I'm going to start this. I'm Sue Lewis, by the way. I'm going to start this morning by just giving a little bit of background of the <coughs> about the sort of academic areas, academic and practical areas, I guess within which maternity location is located. So I'll be talking about some things that some of you are very, very familiar with, maybe perhaps others less familiar. So we can't hear you very well. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> we can't hear you very well. Is that better? Okay. Okay, so as I say, I'm going to talk about the areas in which um, maternity protection is located. Um, it's, a num it's an issue um, within a number of interests. First of all, it's a work and family issue. It's about having babies and working. <coughs> Secondly, very obviously, it's a gender issue. <coughs> Thirdly, it's not always recognized as obvious. It is a business issue or a workplace issue or an economy issue. Of course, you need, we need women working in the economy. Uh, and fourthly, it's a cultural issue. It is also a health issue, a demographic issue, and a legal issue, but I'm not really talking about those. Other people will be talking about those. Um, so first of all, then, maternity protection is a work and family issues, issue. How many work and family researchers do we have here? A few. Can you ask the question again? How many people here are doing research on work and family, aspects of work and family? Still a few. <laughs> okay. Um, well, research on work and family uh, began with the work, seminal work of um, Rowan and Robert Rappaport, actually as far back as the late 1960s, although it took longer to, do, to become popular. But what they did, which was so important, was that they pointed out that the world of work and the world of family are closely related. But up until that time, work was studied by organizational sociologists, organizational psychologists, and so on. Family was studied by family scientists, but never studied together. Since that time, um, research recognizing the links between work and family, that they are actually interdependent, um, has, has increased tremendously. And there's a, a huge number of, of work and family researchers now. But this is the, the point about work and family research is that it challenges assumptions about separate spheres. The basic assumption which many people still hold is that w work is one thing and it's mostly male, and family is another domain and it's mostly female. But in fact, um, women work, men have roles in family. So work and family research is just research which recognizes that these are not separate spheres, that they're interconnected. Um, most of the work family research um, has been rather quantitative and positivist. For instance, there's a huge body of research which looks at work family conflict or work family enrichment, asking do work and family roles conflict or do they enrich each other. M mostly based on questionnaires, uh, mostly developed, well, I think it's almost all developed in the West, particularly in America. Um, there's been much less research on, uh, much less qualitative research on people's experiences, uh, um, nuanced research on people's experiences of uh, crossing those domains. But there is one um, area of research within the work family field um, which uses a life course approach. Uratcha over here has done research using a life course, life course approach. Um, which looks at the various transitions and turning points in people's lives. And of course, one of those most important transitions and turning po points is becoming a mother or a father. So there is a body of research on the transition to parenthood. And I just suggested a couple of, refer a couple of references, one American by Lajan Greenberg, which should be 2050, not 92,000. <laughs> um, and one by Nelson et al., which is uh, based on a European project that we did, looking at comparing transition to parenthood. So that's an important area of research relevant to um, maternity protection. 
There's also a lot of research on family-friendly policies, policies to help people to manage work and family, sometimes called work-life balance. Anybody here use the term work-life balance? Is it familiar in Malaysia? Okay, well, there are problems with that term because when we were talking about family research, family-friendly policies, we were talking, most of the research was about working parents, especially working mothers, and the transition to parenthood. Once we start talking about work-life balance, we're talking about work and men and women, and we're talking about um, having time to do other things. And very often in work-life balance research, other things might be leisure and so on, which are equated with becoming a parent, and which are totally different. Um, so, and the work-life balance discourse, where's Deirdre? Deirdre and I have been doing research looking at work-family, work-life balance discourses, um, particularly in, in the UK, in the public sector. And we found that work-life balance discourses are actually used in ways which are not really um, necessarily um, in favour of workers. They are used to, for example, say, we've got these work-life balance policies to enable people to work less, for example, which means working less for less money to manage the recession. So, what I want to say is that you know, if we're using the term work-life balance in relation to maternity protection, we need to be a little bit critical about it and reflective about it. Um, finally, most work family research, as I've already said, is carried out in the West, or there's quite a lot of research in non-Western countries which use Western measures. So there's some very uh, widely used measures of work family conflict and so on. Um, some researchers modify them to use in uh, non-Western countries, but some some just use them as they are. And the, the body of research on work and family and family-friendly policies and so on tends to neglect small enterprises, self-employment, and informal work. So it's an important area of research relevant to our topic, but there are some limitations. Um, secondly, maternity protection is, of course, a gender issue. I think everybody here is working in the area of gender. It's about mothers and fathers, social construction of motherhood and fatherhood, experiences of motherhood and fatherhood, and of course the way in which gender intersects with uh, ethnicity and other factors, social class and so on. Um, it's about gendered cultural norms around the transition to parenthood, um, becoming a mother, becoming a father, are very important. We'll be talking a lot about that, I think, during the next few days. And it's also about the motherhood penalty. Um, we know that there is a gender gap in earnings everywhere, I think. Um, it's much greater for mothers, of course. Um, in some countries, the gender gap has almost disappeared among men and women before they have children. Once they have children, then the gender gap becomes much greater. And that includes not just the gap between mothers and men, but also mothers and women without children. Um, a lot of research uh, looking at gender in, in relation to maternity protection draws on gendered organizational theory um, by um, Lottie Balin and others, and talks particularly about uh, ideal workers. The social construction of the ideal worker. Um, well, gendered organizational theory points to the fact that Employing organizations are not gender neutral. That's the first very basic thing. We assume they're gender neutral, but they're not. Um, ideal workers are normally socially constructed as workers who work full time, continuously, don't have breaks, or for instance, maternity. Um, they put work first and family second. And of course, that totally conflicts with the social construction of the ideal mother in most contexts, which is somebody who might do a bit of work, but always puts family first. So these gendered organizational assumptions are very important when we're looking at maternity protection. There are other gendered organizational assumptions as well about what work is valued. Not just what type of work, we, we know that male work is valued more than female, typically female work in most contexts, but also how work is done. Um, so for instance, working um, in stereotypically male ways, aggressively, rather than stereotypically female workers, female styles of work collaboratively, uh, are valued differently. And very often, the more female, stereotypically female collaborative work, which is what we are embodying here, 
is less valued. So that's all to do with gender assumptions in organizations. There's also a body of work on the female body at work in maternity management. Um, in Britain, Caroline Gattel's done a lot of work about that, about how women have to manage their body at work. Because if the ideal worker is someone who doesn't take breaks from someone, is a man, <laughs> then of course, being pregnant, breastfeeding and so on, has to be managed. Sometimes women feel they have to hide this, otherwise they will be sidelined. There is a body of action research, which <clears throat> I may talk about later <coughs> in the workshop, which um, tries actively to challenge some of these organizational assumptions. Thirdly, maternity protection is a business or workplace, or economy issue. Um, in terms of the economy, we know that uh, we know from the World Bank and various uh, other publications that getting more women in the workplace is the most important thing for economic development. In terms of individual organizations, in the West, in particularly in, in America and Europe, um, there's often a business case made for um, family-friendly policies or maternity protection. That is, the business case is that businesses or employers will benefit from being able to attract the best workers and retain the best workers if they offer family-friendly policies like extended maternity leave or flexible work and so on. But that's fine. Um, we talk about a dual agenda, uh, which is that if you you know you need to have policies which benefit both the workers and the employers. But that's fine if you're talking about these valued workers, these elite workers. But what about precariously employed workers, informal workers? What about workers where uh, they're doing low-skill jobs and the employers don't mind if they lose them because there are plenty more workers out there? So the business case is limited in its applicability. I'll talk about economic development. Um, so in order to get over this issue of the less valued workers. It's very important to have regulation, and um, Bianca is going to talk more about this, uh, maternity protection, which is necessary, but as Bianca will point out, it's not sufficient. It's a first step to have maternity protection. It doesn't guarantee that um, women will be protected through maternity. Uh, more recently, Deirdre and I have been talking about a triple agenda instead of a dual agenda. Uh, rather than just looking at benefits to employers and employees, we're trying to change the discourse so that we look at the benefits to employers, employees, and social justice. But um, maybe David will talk more about this later. Even in not even in Britain, um, employers find it difficult to um, to really talk about the social justice element, don't they? But that's our aim: to bring the social justice in as well as the pure business case so that we do cover these precariously employed and self-employed. And then maternity protection is a cultural issue. Um, within work family research, there have been a lot of calls recently for more attention to context, particularly national context in work family research. And about time too. Um, I used to edit, founded and used to edit a, a, a journal called Community Work and Family. And one of the things we used to complain about was whenever we got a um, uh, an article from anywhere outside the States, they would say, this is in Britain, this is in Malaysia, this research was carried out in South Africa or whatever. And when we got um, research from America, they'd say, this is the world, you know. Um, <laughs> this is the situation. This is how many people there are in the labor market and so on. Um, so now, the Americans, where most of the research comes from, are recognizing the context is important. And actually, the American USA is a very important context because they don't the only country without paid maternity leave. Um, so more attention to context is needed. Context is both <coughs> structural and cultural. So structural context includes policies, laws, childcare, availability, working conditions, transport, all those things. And cultural context is beliefs and values and norms and family roles. So it's very important when we're looking at maternity protection in Malaysia, we're aware of all these uh, aspects of culture, and they will differ in different, different occupations, different parts of the country. Uh, there are a lot of theories of national culture, which are, again, based in quite positivist research, Hofstede, uh, Globe, and so on, 
things like individualism, collectivism, gender egalitarianism, which try to, which are sort of the typologies which try to typify different cultures. Um, they're useful up to a point, but again, I don't think they go far enough. Um, what we found in our ILO report was that we need, and in other research that we've done, is that we need to look at layers of culture as they intersect. Um, so national, regional, occupational, organizational culture and organizational subcultures, employment relations, trade unions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we need to look at, it's not just enough to, for example, just look at Malay, maternity protection in Malaysia. There are so many other aspects of culture that we need to take account of. And time is an important factor. Things change over time, and it's important to, to take that into account. I think it's very important to look at history of um, a context that you're studying and the way, the way forward. Um, in, terms of, in terms of looking forward and looking backwards, I did um, uh, a sort of global, not global, but international uh, study, a Ford Foundation study of work-life balance, uh, looking at how discourses of work-life balance and policies um, and media discussions and so on had developed across a number of countries. And one of the countries was uh, India. We did India, Japan, South Africa and other countries, but one of them was India. And we had a, a country meeting and people were saying, do you know, work-life balance is now, at this stage of development, work-life balance is the most important social issue in India. And we said, India, this is the most important social issue? So when we dug into that, what, first of all, the reason why they talked about work-life balance was because the big multinational companies um, had um, national staff surveys which asked, how is your work-life balance? And these people, they did have an understanding of it because they're working very long hours, and so they said, yes, it was a big problem. So from that, they said, this is our biggest problem, which <laughs> obviously it wasn't. So we had to look at that in the social context of where they'd come from and where they were going to. And one of the things they said to us within this timeline, people, so particularly employers, of course, were saying to us, which shocked us, was, well, first of all, and this is about 15 years ago, they said, first of all, we need to develop to catch up with the rest of the world. When we've developed, then we can start thinking about social issues. So <laughs> looking backwards at what's happened and looking at the way people are thinking about the future is very important. Um, have I finished my time? Okay. Who's, who's keeping time? All right, well, just very quickly then. I'll just say something about international research. There's lots and lots of, inter of, of research on work and family, quantitative research on work and family, if, if you're interested in that. Um, and there's a, a new report in the um, Academy of Management Journal by um, Ariane Olya Malater and um, her colleague. Um, which overviews, which, which it's, just, it's actually a systemic review of the quantitative research on work and international research, comparative research. That's what there is. What there is a need for, and what we're hoping to address here, um, is much more context sensitive research. Not just comparing uh, work family conflict in countries which might be high or low on again, gender egalitarianism or, or something else. But, Research which really looks at the different layers of context and the processes uh, 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 which, which affect people's experiences of the transition to parenthood. We need more systemic research um, and we need to look at systemic change and over time in culture and practice. By systemic I mean holistic, for instance, if you're looking at an organisation, you don't just look at do they have family friendly policies, but you need to look at all their other uh, policies. What's their uh, appraisal systems, do they take account of maternity, all these other things in context. And we need more innovative local research methods for capacity buildings at different layers of context. So these are all things that we'll expand on um, <coughs> later in the, in the uh, programme. So I was going to talk about some, um, some methods, but I think it's more appropriate to leave that another time. So that's, that's the, uh, the background. And I'm going to hand over to Bianca, who's going to uh, talk much more specifically about the research on maternity protection.